apartment investing and the structure of the business was a perfect vehicle where I feel, felt that I had a skill set that would translate over well to it. But it was also a business that was built on leveraging systems and teams that was going to allow me to come in with my skill set and build wealth while also enjoying life at the same time. The, because. Welcome to the Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment, and financial freedom. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Welcome back to the Path to Wealth. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. And today we have a very special guest, Aaron Cutts. A successful multifamily syndicator and deal sponsor, he's not only focused on investing in real estate, but also his health and self-development. In this episode, Aaron will share his 10-year journey in multifamily syndication with us, and we will hear about his path to becoming an apartment investor. It's an honor to have you on the show, Aaron. Thank you for joining us today. Honest, thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here with you, uh, kicking off the new year here in 2023 with you. So thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm delighted. This is uh, starting the year on the right foot. And I was looking forward to our conversation because beyond just being an apartment investor, I also love that you're very health conscious and really driving it forward in the self-development part of your life. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation for both of us. I agree. And it was it was through personal development that I really found and, and got involved uh, with apartment investing um, so that it all is part of a big circle. So um, I agree. Apartment investing for me is part of a, a holistic, uh, well-rounded lifestyle. And I love to talk about apartment investing, but I love to talk about all the components of a holistic life as well. So I'm looking forward to the conversation on us. Nice. So where did you originally get started when it comes to the money mindset and investing? Where did your journey begin on this aspect of your life? Well, if I think about the aspect of a money mindset, I would think about the entrepreneurial spirit. And I would think that that certainly probably came from my father. Uh, my father was uh, born in Russia, uh, lived there for the first 10 years of his life, poor, moved to Israel uh, for the next four and came to the U.S. when he was 14 years old in 1961. Um, poor immigrant. They, my, my father's side of the family moved to Chicago. Um, my grandfather's first job was at a department store in Chicago called Marshall Fields, and he was literally a janitor there. So starting at square one, coming here and chasing the American dream. Uh, fast forwarding though a little bit, my father in his 20s quickly realized that uh, it, to become wealthy and successful, he felt that you had to be your own boss. And he realized that because for a long time, he wasn't his own boss in his late teens and early 20s, working six, often seven days a week, even when I was young. And so he started a few different businesses to try to get it off the ground and eventually found success in the mattress, in the bedding industry in his late 20s, early 30s. Um, but it was through hard work and perseverance. So I certainly learned under my father's, uh, you know, at my father's footsteps. Um, and then when I was young, he always taught me about the entrepreneurial spirit, modeled it for me. And I, I did every job that you could do in and around the mattress business, around my father's business when I was young, as he was going to instill the value of hard work and, and dedication to me. So um, that's kind of where it got started in the entrepreneurial sense. Now, on the investing side, I would say that that came more just from being a huge reader. And I think that you and I, Hannes, would both agree that reading is definitely a part of a holistic lifestyle, self-development, personal growth. And I've been a voracious reader my entire life. And I had read many books around real estate investing, uh, different types of real estate investing all through my 20s and even my 30s and thought that's something I would like to do one day. But I, I always would focus on different things and different businesses and really never got, got around to it. And it was in my late 30s when I I finally decided 
I'm going to go ahead and do this now. And that was what led me to attending a few different events around 2010, 2011, that led me to eventually attending a Lifestyles Unlimited event with a gentleman uh, named Brad Sumrock teaching it. And it was at that point that I decided, okay, this apartment investing is a business that I could take my prior uh, skill set from prior businesses that I had been a part of, and I could bring that skill set over, learning the industry-specific knowledge I would need to know from Brad to become successful. And that's how I got started here in apartment investing back in 2011, uh, seeking to do my first syndication deal right out of the gate with no prior real estate investing experience. You know, I I love this. I also love the part about your dad because he truly embodied the American dream. I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons people like me still come to the United States and there are still today people from all over the world coming to this country because, you know, that's the possibility here in a, in a free country where you can truly pull this off. And uh, and I think within two generations, both of you have really underlined what what is possible in the United States. Yeah, I agree. I, I I certainly have a lot of respect for what my family came here and achieved. And even my, my grandfather and my grandmother, I, I told you when he first came here, his first job was at a a uh, department store in Chicago as a janitor. Well, they went in on to own their own uh, dry cleaning and later formal wear businesses as well. So even though they were in their 40s when they came here, they, in addition to my father, also went on to model uh, the American dream. And I think that obviously gets lost a lot in today's you know, culture and a lot of people sometimes are down on America. But if you speak to an immigrant, they they see the opportunity uh, that that's available here. And America is still, you know, the greatest country in the world for offering that type of opportunity for, you know, people from all over the world, obviously. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, people people back home in Europe, they often ask me, it's like, why are you overseas? What, what's different then? I'm like, you know, it's just a different boat to row in. Like if you, if you want to row hard, that's fine, but sit in the proper boat that gets you somewhere, you know? And for, for me, that boat has always been in the United States and not in Europe because here I feel like my boat was always tied up and there is just, there seems to be less freedom around opportunity and less upward mobility. And, and the, the beauty is when, when I, when I hear your story and when I see my story and the, the story of my friends who, and actually a lot of people in the multifamily space, I see immigrants thrive. I agree very much. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I like that, that the family, you know, instilled those values in you and, um, really made sure that, uh, you, you have the hard work, the diligence, but you also became business savvy. So what brought you into multifamily real estate? And it was kind of at the perfect start of the decade of what I always look at as the golden decade of real estate investment in the United States. Um, so why then and there, what, what turned you on to real estate after the mattress business? Really, because it was it and I love to tell people I didn't grow up dreaming of owning apartment buildings, apartment investing and the structure of the business was a perfect vehicle where I feel, felt that I had a skill set that would translate over well to it. But it was also a business that was built on leveraging systems and teams that was going to allow me to come in with my skill set and build wealth while also enjoying life at the same time the because the business was leveraged and built on systems of teams of people i was going to be able to work with other people and delegate to them to where i wasn't going to have to adopt that grind mentality of working 60 to 80 hours a week i was going to be able to build a lifestyle that i could enjoy while i was running these apartment investing businesses and growing wealth at the same time and i feel that that is really part of a holistic lifestyle um if anybody follows me i think they see that i love to travel i have a lot of different hobbies and interests that i'm invested in so and i'm also very invested in my apartment investing businesses as well and in how i structure and set those up but all those things are possible with apartment investing and that's one of the reasons that i chose it as the vehicle i felt uh, all of those things in concert that it would be a great vehicle to allow me to achieve all of those uh, 
ends. And I think one of the beautiful parts around syndication is that not only, you know, does it allow you to have this great lifestyle, but you also are able to um, send back checks to your investors. And I always like to say every check that we return to our investors is a, you know, a dream come true for someone because, you know, it could be child education, it could be their house, it could be their next big trip. And, um, and I mean, you've been doing that for a decade. How does it feel to you? It feels really good. And um, I do get a lot of notes from my investors sometimes about what the returns, what the profits from investments that they have partnered with me in passively investing with me and what what that means to them or what they've been able to do with the money, maybe in terms of you know, philanthropic type of endeavors or, or charitable endeavors, or just how they were able to provide for their families. So sure, it's obviously what I'm able to do for myself and my family. And then it's also about how myself and my investors are able to come in and improve communities and give our residents a great place to live. But sure, the ripple effect from myself out to my investors and, and them being able to take those usually and hopefully always great returns but not always sometimes i'm thrilled to say in 12 years in this industry i've never had an investor lose money but i'd also be lying if i said that every single one of my deals has hit or exceeded projections most of them have and have been extremely successful and a few of them have not but even those ones that have not all the investors got all their money back and did make us profit on top. So overall, I'm very you know happy with my track record and I'm completely transparent and willing to openly you know share it with anybody. When I got into this industry, I, I felt that it was also a business that I could just come in and be real in. And I think that that's been one of the things that has allowed people to, I would hope, gravitate toward me is that I wear who I am and I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'm completely transparent and open and honest. And maybe for some people, I'm not going to be their cup of tea and that would rub them the wrong way. But I think for most people, people want to invest and like to do business with people that they know, like, and trust. And I think that the only way that people can know somebody before you even get to that like and trust part of know, like, and trust is to just put who you are completely out there. So I've always sought to, to do that in this business. And I think that's part of a holistic lifestyle is I have the freedom to, there's not the apartment investing or the business side of Aaron Katz and then this completely other side. It's all part of who I am and it all works together, I think, in a, a well-rounded holistic lifestyle. Was that a very organic um thing for you or was it a conscious decision like i i see some people and and i guess to some degree you know we, we're trying to put our best selves out there you know obviously i i try to take the best shot and put it on, po on top of my podcast um but at, at the same time there's a way of doing it very brand conscious and trying to curate a brand or did you from the beginning and maybe even based on your history you were like this is who i am you know and and kind of take it or leave it this is how we how we um conduct ourselves and this is how we do business i think more around more around the latter that i was just going to put myself out there my brand is aaron katz um that's the name of my business there's there's nothing else not to say that it's wrong to have you know uh if you're going to call it you know, cat's capital, that's great. Sometimes maybe somebody's name is not even in that. And and that's great too. And that works for some people. But for me, it was very much, I think, a conscious decision from the get-go that it was just going to be Aaron Katz. This is who I am. I had a very specific model of how I wanted to set up the business to allow me to live my lifestyle. And sure, it's been modified and maybe adapted along the way. And we can talk about that. But a lot of it is still that same basic structure and vision that I set out with when I first came into the industry back in uh, 2011. So it was very much a conscious decision to put who, who I am out there completely. And, you know, like I said, good or bad, uh, maybe some people can't understand why I like this or this is a hobby of mine, but I just want to be completely real and um, then kind of just let the chips fall where they may. And I think 
it's worked well for me. Uh, you know, might, might something have worked better if I did it a different way, perhaps, but doing it this way has allowed me to feel that I'm leading my life with the kind of authenticity that makes me feel good inside. And, you know, helps, helps me to, to get up each day knowing that I'm being completely true to myself. So what was the progression you, you started out a little bit over a decade ago, um, you know, and th at that stage, vehicle is your, your, uh, real estate is your vehicle for financial freedom. But over the years, it, it has transformed into so much more and you were able to readjust your life and maybe your goals in life. Maybe you, you can give us a little bit of an overview, how you went from, um, real estate investor towards the life you have today, which is very holistic and well-rounded and how that natural progression was for you. Sure. Well, I, I, I always had that vision. I, and obviously though, in the beginning, I would say, especially my first five to six years in the business, um, I did everything in all of my early syndication deals, meaning I had no other GP partners. I had key principals that would sign on the loan, but I was the only GP in all of my deals for my first five years in the business. So I was wearing all of the different hats. So obviously that was more time consuming at that yeah. time. And I did have to put in more time. And then later I started to see the value and some of it maybe was a control thing, but also when I got started, the mode of multiple GPs wasn't as much in fashion as it seems to be today in the apartment investing business. But I certainly saw the value in it being able to delegate maybe some parts of the business that I didn't feel were either maybe not my strongest suit as an apartment investor or a syndicator, or even if it was a very strong suit for me, maybe something I just didn't want to do anymore. And I could partner with other complementary partners that would be strong and willing to fulfill those roles in apartment investing projects. So it moved from early where I was wearing all of the hats to uh, partnering. And then now to where I am, I have a very specific role that I'm looking to fill in uh, the GP partnerships, which is um, I've, I've pretty much completely phased myself out of being the active primary asset managers on my project. Now, per SEC requirements, I'm still listed, of course, as an asset manager, and I consult and join in on some calls with my partners, but I'm not the day-to-day -day active asset managers that are Uh, working directly with the property management companies. I uh, delegate that to my partners. And as long as they're doing a terrific job and the numbers are where they need to be and the property's performing, then I don't need to get involved. And I'm happy to let my partners run with the vision that we put together at the onset of a project. So I think my role has, has been adapted as I've moved throughout the years. And obviously, that and moving into the partnerships and completely phasing myself out of the primary active asset management management Hannes has opened up time which has allowed me to to maybe explore the lifestyle a, a little bit more so i would guess i would say you know reaping maybe some of the fruits of 11 12 years in the business at this point yeah so you just recently had a a new partnership in acquiring a, a property in Arlington, Texas. Maybe you can speak a little bit about um, what are you looking for in partners to make a suitable fit? Sure. Great question. Thank you for asking it because I love to talk about this. Well, uh, I'm looking for partners that are, are going to be the boots on the ground. I'm, I'm not actively out there speaking with brokers in different markets like I was for many years. Um, at this point, what I want to do is work with partners that are doing that. And then what I want to do is be the experienced partner that I've raised over $50 million personally from investors in my database over the years. So I have a history of being able to successfully raise a lot of capital for apartment investing projects. I also have a wealth of experience, although I'm not looking to be actively involved on a day to day basis. I'm certainly there uh, to share whatever experience from 
11 years in the business that I can and contribute that uh, to these partners. So I'm looking for partners that are going to be the boots on the ground. They're doing the day to day. They want to take on that primary active asset management. And uh, I'm going to fulfill those roles, uh, perhaps depending on the market, especially maybe where I'm really connected and all of the brokers know me like Dallas Fort Worth. Perhaps I can be part of the team before the deal is awarded and I can help a group and get the deal awarded to them because I have a longstanding relationship with the brokers. Um, a lot of people forget that when I first, uh, in, in the early part of the business, uh, when Brad Sumrock first launched his program back in 2013, he has a buyer brokerage component of the business. And I was working with Brad and buyer brokerage from 2013 to 2015. So I think a lot of people forget that, especially that have come along since 2015 in the last seven years. So I really got to know and be very connected with a lot of the top brokers here in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I know them personally and I vacation with some of them. So I have great relationships. So here in a market like DFW, I can certainly uh, perhaps help a deal be awarded. But even if I come aboard a, a team to where a deal's already been awarded, um, I think that one of my skill sets is being able to take that deal and, and market it to potential investors. So I love being part of formulating the vision for the property. Of course, I have to have buy-in on the people that are, are doing the deal, my potential partners. I have to have buy-in on the market. I have to have buy-in on the potential sub-market. And I have to have buy-in on their underwriting. So let's say somebody is about to be awarded a deal or has even been awarded a deal. The first thing I want to see is their underwriting and the vision. And I need to completely buy in on that. I'm going to check their underwriting against market data and, and what I think makes sense. And if I see a bunch of red flags and, and truth be told, I'm sent deals, Hannes, uh, sometimes where there are a lot of red flags and I decline partnerships. Uh, the hub, for example, though, I had already been meeting with uh, Jeff Johnson and Carrie Johnson and Nick Espinette, who's a coach in the Sumrock program. I had known Nick, uh, although we maybe we didn't really know each other. We had known each other because we ran in the same circles for years and he was an experienced investor. So we were already laying the groundwork to do a partnership before the hub deal came along. And that's very important to me because I think a lot of people just jump and partner together when there's a deal and I've been in this business for 11 years, but I've only done 13 deals on the GP side. My wife and I have also invested in uh, 17 deals passively. So all told, I've done 13 projects, 2,500 doors, and invested in another 3,500 doors passively for a total of about 6,000 doors. Now, 13 deals as a GP in 11 years, that's probably not going to sound like a big number to a lot of people because some people come in this industry and they do that. Uh, many deals in a year or two, but you know, what are their roles and how big is their stake of ownership? And a lot of people don't, you know, talk about these things. How involved are they? Are they just coming in and raising a little capital? But other than that, have no involvement in the deals. I want to be, even though my role in the deal is defined, I want to feel comfortable with all aspects of the deal. So I say no to a lot more partnerships than I say yes to. And I think only having done 11 or 13 deals across 11 years speaks to that. So uh, regarding the hub, and I'll, I'll kind of summarize it because I've given a long answer to a short question. I think it was already laying the groundwork to partner with the people that I ended up partnering with. And then when the right deal came along, it was making sure that that deal made sense. And I believed in that deal from the top down, from the market, the sub market, the underwriting, the vision. And then I was able to work with them on, you know, on taking the deal out to investors and raising the capital to get the deal closed. So Hopefully that answers uh, the question for you. Yes, of course. And so coming out of one of the best decades in terms of interest rates and everything, what is your personal assumption? Just a little bit of an outlook. Where do you think we're headed over the next one or a couple of years? Well, what are you currently communicating with your passive investors when they ask those questions? Obviously, I get asked those questions and the first answer 
is always nobody nobody has a crystal ball right and and you've probably heard that before and it's almost cliche at this point to say that nobody has a crystal ball so <clears throat> I think that we have to look at the, the best information that we have at hand to make the best assumptions that we can make at, at any given time. And that's why to this day, I stay very plugged in with the Brad Sumrock apartment group. Because I want to make sure that I'm still listening to other people and mentors. And obviously, my mentors have mentors as well, especially if it's, excuse me, lost my voice there for a second. So just 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 staying very much plugged in and just using the best information that we we can at any time, certainly looking at markets that um, are going to perform more solidly, um, landlord friendly, business friendly markets that are showing, you know, economic growth, population growth, job growth, avoiding markets that don't have those markets that are uh, landlord and business friendly. And obviously, you know, a lot of times those uh, particular markets fall on one side of the political equation, and we won't talk politics here, but those tend to be the markets that I, I focus on. And, you know, plugging in the best numbers with the best assumptions, assumptions at any given time based on the market data that we have. And, you know, feeling pretty strong, stress testing uh, the particular opportunities to make sure that they make sense if, if things fluctuate and that we're going to still be in a good position. And I think that that's the best you can do. And I still think that given all those things and any potential risk, <clears throat> that apartment investing is still going to be, you know, one of the safest and best investments that, you know, anybody could make, even despite any uncertainty that might still be there yeah so shifting gears a little bit what did the freedom of having the income from apartments do for yourself in life you you already mentioned you're a family guy you like to travel you know you have a certain lifestyle but beyond that um i think we all dream of lifestyle but then i think there is something that sets in once we get used to the lifestyle and the freedom and especially having time and and my personal belief is that everybody becomes more giving and more self-aware and there's time for contemplation and that's certainly something that i've witnessed uh, with yourself too so what was that transition like for you or that progression probably more of a natural one maybe and less of a conscious one um, continuing while I was progressing as an apartment investor. And we just shared some of that journey, Hannes, but continuing to, to read, continuing to invest myself in personal growth and self-development and not just personal growth and self-development related to the apartment investing sphere, but personal growth and self-development in every single area, whether that be, attending you know different spiritual or uh emotional retreats where i could continue to grow myself um because that's that was it was out of that 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 i found apartment investing it was by searching for the right vehicle for myself uh so i i think by continuing to be a reader and always trying to grow whether it be you know physically emotionally spiritually you know becoming a meditator um, on, you know, usually a daily basis um, and, and just trying to become a, a more well-rounded person as a whole and then being open and willing to whatever comes along that allows me to grow and maybe not resisting change and not always feeling like I think some people want to stay the same. And obviously sometimes growth takes us in different areas than, you know, we would expect um, when we were prepping for the event right before we, we started rolling the cameras, you mentioned how I had stopped drinking a couple of years ago. Well, that was really nothing that I had planned. It was just something that came about. And I realized that for me to continue to grow the way that I wanted to, that that was going to be something I was going to have to do. And I went with that even though, and it was something that kind of just organically came about as I sought to, to continue to grow. Yeah. That, that's a very interesting one. 
because I remember when I started practicing a lot more yoga, I realized that a single drink the night before affected me getting up in the morning or it would affect my meditation practice. So for me, it was like the natural consequence that, okay, I, I guess I'll just skip the beverage the night before or whatever. And, and then for people around me, it always looked like I'm giving something up. And, and I was like, no, I, I think I'm actually gaining life quality here. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And that was when I first quit, I felt at first that I was going to be giving up, but, but what I've been able to gain and I shared openly, uh, what it's given me, if anybody follows me on Facebook and I'm sure you've read some of my posts because I'm not looking, uh, nor in any area of my life, would I ever believe that I have the right to impose my views or my opinion on anybody, nor would I ever judge or anybody uh, for any of their own views. I believe that everybody is entitled to their own opinion and their own thoughts. And I'm going to respect everybody's right to their own opinions and thoughts, whether those are the same as my own anyway. And I think that that's something lost for the most part in a lot of mainstream culture now is people with different lifestyle choices or different opinions uh, about different things, just having intelligent discourse and being able to enjoy each other's company. So uh, I share openly from my story, not in the, uh, not to convert anybody that doesn't want to be converted, but to reach people that maybe you're struggling in a certain area. And if anything in my life, whether it's around drinking or my apartment investing journey or anything else that I might be going through in my personal life, if there's some value from my experience and I can impart that to other people and help them, then I'm happy to be an open book and, and to do that because I think that's going to be maybe part of my legacy. My legacy you know, there, there's my apartment investing part of my legacy, uh, providing for myself, my family, my children, my passive investors, uh, the people that live in our apartment communities. But I have the opportunity, uh, maybe because of the profile apartment investing gives me to impact so many, many, so many people in many different areas. So I'm just, that's kind of why going back to what we talked about before and choosing to be open and share all of who I am. I think that gives me the opportunity to have a positive impact that goes beyond just the world of apartment investing. Yeah. I, I, I call this conscious capitalism. And I, like and that. I think, I think it's the best form of um, the best form we have yet. Like, you know, I, th I think capitalism in itself can be very rough, but if we add some consciousness to it and some humanity and empathy, it, it can be a very good structure. So what was one of the things you mentioned meditation and emotional retreats, what were one of the, th or some of the things that moved the needle for you the most where you felt you're reaching a different state of wholeness in your life? That's a good question. Um, I, I would say maybe an inner peace um, internally, um, beginning to feel more comfortably with trusting my intuition and knowing what's right for me, certainly being willing to listen always to mentors and other people around me, but always going within to figure out specifically what is right for me um, from that place of inner peace and trusting my own intuition more. Um, always being willing to hear other advice, taking the advice and applying it that I feel applies to me, and then letting maybe go of some of the advice that does not apply specific to me because we're all different. And what's right for somebody might not be right for somebody else. So um, I think as I've grown my meditation practice and found more inner peace and just being more comfortable in my own skin, that I think one of the answer to your question is really that my intuition has grown and has become stronger. And um, 
I'm willing to follow and trust it a lot more. And I think it served me well. So um, I think that that's one of the, the main, the main parts of this journey um, that, that through, through apartment investing and through this, this process of growth, that's been the biggest things for me. Yeah. Given that we're in something that's actually very logically dominated, which is apartment investing, how do you pair that with intuition? I mean, I, I guess I personally can, uh, in, I have a better sense of intuition now when it comes to people. But how do you pair that with the logical aspect of the business that we're in? Sure. Well, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive at all. Um, I think that they can work together very well. And I think that they do. And I think I'm able to. Obviously, the logic side of the business, the numbers, the factual information is all there. And it needs to play a part in every decision. But I think that going within and trusting my intuition around at the end of the day, sure, I'm going to look at the resumes and the background and the experience of potential partners. But at the end of the day, I'm going to trust my gut a lot to feel who I have that connection with and who I'm willing to invest in and who I'm willing to trust, who I'm willing to uh, bring before my investor database that I've carefully cultivated over the last 11, 12 years and, and, and partner with on these projects. So, um, and even back in, in, in my prior background business, because much like my father, I followed him into the mattress business and I shared that story. And that's originally what brought me down here to Texas, uh, in the mid nineties was being part of a, a different company than mattress discounters, which was the company my dad originally started started and grew back in the late seventies uh, was a company here in Texas called mattress giant. And we eventually grew that to 60 stores in four different markets. And um, even then uh, you know, that, that model of entrepreneurship that I learned uh, my, at the feet of my father, uh, when it was selecting locations for retail stores, a lot of it came down to, sure, you could look at the information, but then it came down to intuition too. And it came down to sensing the energy. I even see businesses now, you might see it in your town where you live, and you see businesses in a certain shopping center and they're always changing. They're always turning over. And then right across the street, you see thriving businesses that have been there for many years. And you say, what is the difference between those two locations when they're only four to 500 feet apart? And there's sometimes just a different energy in, in, a, in a certain intersection, a corner of an intersection, maybe the northeast corner of the intersection versus the southeast corner of an intersection. And I think that being able to you know, tap into some of that energy, which we can access through intuition is part and parcel of everything. So I'm not trying to get to, you know, this might sound too new agey and fooey to some people, you no, no, could probably think, agree, but I think yeah. it's a partnership of, of taking all that factual information, that real data, that logic, and certainly being, uh, having a comprehensive understanding of all of that, but then also not eliminating that other side and recognizing that everything is energy and we have access to tapping into that energy, uh, within us. And I'm sure that you being a purveyor of a, you know, a holistic, well-rounded lifestyle, and we've talked offline and I know viewers of your podcast have certainly learned about some of your, your philosophies. Um, I'm sure some of what I'm saying probably resonates with, with you as well. Yeah. hundred, hundred percent. I mean, it, it, with, uh, without going too far and too new agey, but you know, there's to some people, it's always the air in between us obviously lifts so much room for things we, we don't, um, experience with our senses. And, and, and I think that's sometimes when I, when I look at signs and it, I feel like now we're getting to a point where there's so much scientific explanation to that and that practices like meditation that allow us to be more aware of what's there already. It's, it's not about, you know, coming up with things. It's just, it's already there. It's just a question. Can we perceive it or not? Right. Tapping back into it. Yeah. 
Very much. Yeah. And, and this is great. I'm enjoying talking about this with you because, and we can certainly talk about apartment investing. I've done it on many other podcasts over the years, but uh, you know, I'm really enjoying talking about, you know, some of these other things that are certainly part of my holistic lifestyle that I think dovetail, you know, well with apartment investing and just creating that, that whole holistic life. Yeah. I think, just to to kind of go down that path a little bit more, for me, meditation, and for some people, meditation might sound like, oh my God, that's that painful practice of sitting. Um, but at the same time, I think that there are many gateways to having a meditative experience. Like it can be taking a shower or it can be walking down a path or it can be sitting a certain way. Um, which allows us to have the presence of the meditative state. But um, I think no matter what I tried in my life, that's the only lasting state of fulfillment. And, you know, it's, it's never been in the success career path. It's never been even in the financial success. And, and I remember some of the, the biggest paydays in my life, even in investments of real estate, um, they weren't as great as those moments of presence that come with meditation. And, and that's, that's truly, you know, what I, what I like to, um, share with the world as such that, you know, career is all fine. Impact is all fine, but I think inspiring people to take a little break and allow themselves to experience a state of presence is the biggest gift that um, I could possibly share with people. And I think the key word there is, is presence. And I think that that's what meditation gives you. And I think also being able to, being able to, to stop and find that, that moment between uh, something on the outside happening and then thoughtfully choosing a response. I know that meditation has taught me that and has, has increased that skill. And I know that that serves me very well in the apartment investing business. I know that it allows me to be much more intentional about how I want to structure my business and how I want to choose to do things uh, in regards to my projects. So I think the, you know, the benefit and, and the wide ranging, um, you know, what I get from meditation certainly touches on every part of my life, which touches on the apartment investing business. And the other thing that, you know, has taught me tremendous presence was just in this last couple of years uh, was, was since I gave up drinking and I was not, uh, you know, an everyday type of drinker. I was more a social drinker. Some people probably would have looked at me and not thought that I had a problem or I had to give up drinking, but I just realized that, I was going to gain more, as you said before, by giving up drinking than I was going to be given up. And growth was calling me to do this, to move forward in my life in, in every different way possible. And one of the great benefits that I wouldn't have even foreseen at that time was the ability to sit and be present in moments in a way that I was not able to do when I was just, uh, you know, you know, drinking on the weekends, almost every weekend or, you know, here or there at different business or social functions. So I think you hit upon it, Hannes, the key word is presence and being able to sit back and be present almost slows things down to where, whether it's in the business world and things get to be moving fast, it almost slows things down to where you're able to make conscious, deliberate uh, decisions that are going to be more in line with what you want to do rather than just being reactive or maybe getting lost emotionally, whether it be in something professional or something personal. So um, those are all things that I've learned uh, that, that stem out of meditation and, and being able to be more present. Yeah. And I, and I think slowing down, having the ability to remain calm when things get either heated or fast is a superpower. hundred percent agree. And, um, you know, it serves me very well here in, in this world of, of apartment investing. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's also what we see in sports, no, like the biggest, players the the goats of any sport 
those are the guys that when hundreds of millions of people are watching them and they have to either kick or throw a ball or hit it with a racket and and they they have the inner calmness to just put it in the right spot I agree a hundred percent and I'm a huge sports fan as well. We talked about some of my hobbies and interests, sports, music. Uh, you know, for example, my, my very favorite sport is ice hockey. And when you think about the goat of ice hockey, well, for me, it's Wayne Gretzky. And people would always say that Gretzky had um, a sixth sense that he knew where the puck was going to be and where his teammates were going to be before they were there, that he almost could tap into that sense of knowing, which kind of ties back into what we were talking about before in regards to intuition and and being present. And certainly the game slowed down for him. So um, I think your analogy is 100% on in regards to sports. Wasn't it him that, I, I think he said in an interview that he always he was always going for where it's going to be like while other athletes are going for where it is so that he had an edge in it. And, and you, you kind of put one on top by saying that he had the intuition to even know where the, the other players of his team were, which. Sure. He was, he was, he was a step ahead of them mentally, a step ahead of everybody on the ice. And he even knew for his teammates where they were going to be probably before uh, they knew. Um, so that was just, um, you know, something he brought. If you look at Gretzky, he didn't look like an athlete. He didn't have the greatest skill set in any particular area. He wasn't the best skater. He wasn't the best shooter, but it was really his mind and his intelligence and, you know, his intuition and his sense of presence that enabled him to be the GOAT. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think sport sport is a big one. I mean, I'm not sure if you watched the uh, uh, soccer World Cup, but that was also like a fascinating game. And some some of those passes, I was just like, how did they even do that? Like it it looked like straight up intuition how they passed those balls, um, because it was moving so quickly. I was like, there's no way he saw that the guy is there, you know? And they, they just incredible. passed it through. Yeah, it was incredible yeah, I, to watch it. Yeah, I know. I marvel at the athletic ability and, and it seems to get, you know, better and better all the time. These athletes continue to evolve. <laughs> <laughs> well, Aaron, this has been uh, super, super interesting. We really had a very holistic uh, view or overall conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. Where can people connect with you, find out about upcoming opportunities or you know, simply see what you're up to. Sure. I'd love to give out my email address and anybody, whether they're interested in potentially passive investing or just want to connect with me to discuss anything that we might have talked about here today, can email me at uh, Aaron Katz 2015 at gmail.com. And maybe when you send it out or post it, you could feel free to share that information as well. Sure. Yeah, yeah sure. and I also want to Edit say I want to say thanks, Hannes, because uh, I've done a lot of real estate investing podcasts over the years, and this has been a very different one and a very enjoyable one. And um, you know, I, I this has been a lot of fun. It's been just a, a terrific conversation. So I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words, and that's exactly what I'm trying to go for. You know, make it holistic and not just uh, number crunching, because I think there's so much more to it. A hundred percent. Yep. Thank you so much, and I look forward to uh, continuing our relationship. And I hope that uh, this is a podcast that your viewers will enjoy. And I encourage anybody to reach out to me at that email address. And um, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth. 